Hi, I'm Eric, the travel guy. And well, once again, we're on another wildly educational adventure. Happy Valley, Pennsylvania is next on Beyond Your Backyard. My name is Eric Hastings. Yeah, that's me. And for as long as I can remember, I've always loved to travel. And I still do today. But you know what I've learned? There's so much more that brings us together than divides us. Which is why I've made it my mission to do the very same things you can do, but to take you beyond the experiences, to uncover the soul of every place we visit. Let me introduce you to the people, the places, and the secrets that remind us how exciting it is to share with one another, to understand one another, and to realize just how connected we really are. I am Eric the Travel Guy, and this is Beyond Your Backyard. Thank you for watching and welcome back. You know, Benjamin Franklin, one of this country's founding fathers once penned, you may delay, but time will not. And if you think about it, time is a pretty curious concept, which is why we're here in Happy Valley, Pennsylvania a unique geographic region in the center of the state consisting of five valleys. On today's episode, we'll explore the passage of time by taking a boat ride through an unbelievable underground cave. We'll marvel at one-of-a-kind artifacts from Christopher Columbus, and we'll get out into the countryside, we'll pick fresh ingredients, and have them prepared in timeless yet classic tradition. It's going to be a good one. Oh, and by the way, if you're curious to know how Louis Vuitton got his start, yeah, we're going to cover that too. Let's get started. We're wasting no time by taking a look at our handy travel map. As you know, the Keystone State is a big state, with Philadelphia over here and Pittsburgh all the way over here. Right in the middle of the state is Center County, home to such charming towns as Belfont, Milheim, and State College, just to name a few. Yes, that State College, where football and education reign supreme at Penn State University. But the purpose of this visit was to take you beyond the campus and discover exactly why and how this place is so darn happy, which is why I spent the morning at Penn's Cave and Wildlife Park. Let's go. I would think that some people, not many, but I would think some people get a little claustrophobic. Oh, yeah. But once they settle in, they realize, okay, nothing, nothing's going to happen. Like, this is it. Even someone who is a little fearful up front? Exactly. As they come in, there's, there's excitement, and there's also a little bit of fear. And then when I reach over here and I do this, uh -oh. it goes from fear to wonder. <laughs> this is incredible. There's a caver in Vancouver who's written some songs, but the one song, it says, I remember the time when first I went caving, the fear and excitement that go hand in hand. And they ask me the question, why do you do it? I tried to find words to help them understand. But if you want to see Penn's Cave, is it safe to say the only way to see it is by boat? Yes. The cave is so fragile. The rock crystals, the soda straws, stalactites. You bump your head against something and 500 years worth of growth is gone. Is gone so human skin produces a natural oil that it's not good for them to be touched because if you touch it a little bit of that residue of the skin oil leaves a coating on the rock and it isn't much but it's enough that it stops the rock crystals from bonding or growing essentially stops the growth of the formations i hear you i respect this i will follow the rules but i just want to go on record as saying i still want to touch it oh i know everybody everybody that comes through says that i mean seriously if you just just to feel the texture of it. Yeah. You see this little brown spot in the ceiling way up here? Yeah. That's a bat. He's sleeping, right? They sleep thing to do. He is. Not hibernation, but something called torpor. See are that? there other animals in here? There are. With the stream, we get muskrats. In the dry room, raccoons, possums, owls, red squirrels. The one legend says that early visitors found the bones or skeletons of two mountain lions. We've had beavers living in here on and off for the last 40 years. Hold up, hold, did you say beaver? Beaver. Oh wait, whoa, now the, all the, this, the, and there's a beaver? The, the kind with the teeth that chews down trees and yes. eats the bark and, yes. and all that. And uh, he's got like four places in here he sleeps and we couldn't always find him. And hence the name Waldo. Where is he? Oh my gosh. This is the greatest day ever. Or he sleeps in here all day, outside at night, he goes to the lake. And that's all, that's all junkies dragged in here. There he is. Hi, buddy. 
This is awesome. They say, do we know how long the Native Americans knew about this cape? They didn't tell people about it. James Martin, when he came down here, he started to tell everybody about this cave that he'd found, and it, it started bringing people here. And then what happened? Well, the, the Europeans came and the settlers, and finally the Native Americans were driven away. Yep. The story goes that the Native Americans would hide in caves in this valley, and they'd pop out, up out of the caves and attack the settlers and then disappear back into the cave again, and nobody knew where they came from or where they went. Where they went. How deep is this water? At the entrance, 15 to 18 feet. Most of it, three or four feet. It's always 52. Wait a second, did you say it's always 52? Always 52. The air temperature is 52? Air temperature. What's the water temperature? Water's 38, water's a little cooler. At the end of the... Uh, kids TV show called Fraggle Rock. Jim Henson. Their oracle, the oracle says, you cannot leave the magic, meaning the cave and the, the rock and the tunnels, it was all magic. And the man moves clear out to Arizona and there's a tunnel and the Fraggles come out of his new home in Arizona. <laughs> so the magic goes with goes you. Not that's so okay. with the cave. You know, you leave here, you go home, but the cave is always with you in your mind, in your heart. You, so you cool. cannot leave the magic. You cannot leave the magic. This experience was absolutely fascinating, which is why I also hopped on a really cool vehicle for a 90-minute guided tour of the wildlife park. about this for just a second. I don't think we've actually talked with anybody on this program that's actually been a member of a wolf pack that I'm aware of, but you legitimately are. <laughs> Spending most of the day getting close to nature reminded me oftentimes these enriching experiences can be found in just about every nook and cranny here. Through the periods of geologic time and the indigenous people, to the colonists and even through dog years, time marches on. And so does the progress of either man or mother nature. And all of this is unfolded on this rich, fertile farmland, which is why I dropped in for lunch at ReFarm Cafe and was shocked at how well they were doing legit farm to table farming and dining. One of the goals with organic regenerative agriculture is to be building the soil. Mm -hmm. And one big way to do that is we never want to leave the soil exposed. Erosion and um, just degradation occurs when there's no plants in the ground. And with cover cropping, we're actually just kind of broadcast seeding um, beneficial plants that will build the soil. They'll add organic matter back in. We are talking science here, but we are talking art, aren't we? It really is all about walking the fields, holding the plants, looking up close, and noticing. And that is part of, I think, the art of it as well, is mm -hmm. it can't all be done from books. It really is so much observation. And there's also the science of the chemistry in the soil and using oh. kind of the technology that we have available to get as much information as possible. It's very fashionable these days to be an organic farm. What does that mean? So it, it really is a promise to the consumer that at the bare minimum, we're going to be following these required practices. Building soil, focusing on the long-term plan for the farm and not just the short-term kind of payoff that mm -hmm. you get with the crop. Mm -hmm. There's a whole list of products that were, you know, not permitted to use, many of the conventional herbicides, pesticides mm -hmm. that um, really have kind of dubious safety. Yep. Does that make the job more difficult? It would be so much easier just to spray yep. poison and kill all the weeds or kill all the pests. One thing that we're now discovering and learning more about is that the soil is actually alive and there is bacteria and fungi and all of these um, tiny species that are serving a purpose that we didn't previously recognize. And when you introduce those foreign substances, you're disrupting that ecosystem and it's gonna have 
so many unintended consequences. And now that we've stopped putting these poisons onto the soil, that diversity can come back, come back. and we can actually grow produce easier and better than what we were doing with conventional methods because it's like antibiotics. You keep putting the same chemicals in, the species get resistant, they stop working eventually, and that's what's happened. Can we pick something while we're out here? We have turnips in here oh, that are turnips. pretty nice. Yeah, um, so yeah, but they're actually ready to go. Oh, there they yeah. are. Do they call that shouldering, or what is it? That, what, yeah, what is... they're popping up. Oh, wow. Yeah, once you see the white tops emerging, um, they're kind of ready to go, and they will start to crack mm -hmm. if they get too large. I'd say these probably have another week or two that they could sit there. These are really great for fresh eating. These uh -huh. are a salad turnip, so they have a, an extremely thin skin and very oh. mild and creamy. Well, let's put them in our salad here. Yeah. Let's take them up to the top of the hill. Duke, I am already salivating. The smell in here, I mean, we were out there walking around and I felt at one with the earth. So it's, it's connecting uh, the land to people, uh, the people to food and to, to each other. And uh, when people have a greater understanding and respect for the food that's being grown, they appreciate it a lot more on a plate. We are a net zero energy. Uh, project means that we produce through our solar panels all the energy we need to operate the cafe. The one thing I know about restaurants, no matter where they built, were terrible abuses of water and energy. So this is a net zero energy project, also net zero water, which means that whatever falls on the property stays on the property. In a way, we're being uh, uh, sort of a, a laboratory uh, for uh, regenerating what restaurants used to be, and that's that's a, a responsible part of the community. That being said, what are we gonna make today? Well, we'll use a little bit of the turnip greens. It's all gonna be part of a little bit of a, a salad. Take a little bit of the root off, and then you're gonna slice it in quarters this way. So part of that salad, which we'll be making, is some Napa cabbage, which is from the farm. Look at that cabbage, come on. We have a delicious pork tenderloin from right here on the farm. So our pigs are very happy. Yep. Uh, they're all pasture raised. Oh, not anymore, they're not. That one's <laughs> they're not. all pasture raised. Purple chili peppers. So we're gonna use a little bit of our pork fat. Pork fat, yep. We're gonna slice up these beautiful tenderloins. Oh, wow. Which were already smoked. Okay. So we're gonna start those. Well, they were hot smoke, but only to about 140. Okay. So now we're we're finishing them off. Got it. Oh, those look amazing. Crunch that up a little bit. We super wash everything, but it's so nice when you don't have to worry about taking chemicals out of food. Mm -hmm. We're going to use just a little bit of lemon juice lemon. today. Yep. I've never seen anybody cook a salad. We'll put a little bit of walnuts in there and uh, some of this blue cheese. Oh my word. I diced up some apples previously. Okay, apple. Hit a little bit of basil. Uh, basil. A little bit of fresh pepper. So a poached egg is gonna go right on top. This is the surprise element. I love surprises. You guys in Pennsylvania love to put eggs on everything. We do. We're ready to plate, and it's very simple. You literally did that in five minutes. I think you've done that a couple times before. Yeah. Well, let's go sit and enjoy. We make our own drinks. This week, because it is seasonal, we have a little bit of pumpkin turmeric juice. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Grilled bread, the turnips that you harvested out in the field, our windswept uh, pork, uh, their mangalistas, the absolutely delicious. Simplicity. That's incredible, though. Oh, I can feel the heat on that. Again, we're telling our guests, showing our guests, loving our guests by giving them the food that's very simply made, mm -hmm. uh, but also very simply delicious, and also uh, maybe sneaky, good for their health. So, mm -hmm. Duke, it really is amazing. Thank you for this, my friend. Oh, you're welcome. My, oh. my absolute pleasure. I never checked my watch once the entire time I was here because the tour was insightful and the food delicious. While we're on the subject, I ate well here in Happy Valley. The locals take their culinary seriously. After all, Happy Valley is synonymous with rich farmland, a lot of fresh water bubbling up from the natural springs, and culinary artists and owners dedicating to representing their little slice of the world with pride.
From elegant meals to casual lunches, come hungry. And don't be shy about asking for the recipe. Oh, speaking of which, the chemistry over at Big Spring Spirits results in delicious craft cocktails, which is why I just had to pay them a visit and learn more about the Central PA Tasting Trail. Currently, we have 11 venues that you can visit that are part of that trail. Really? Mm -hmm. 11? Yeah. In such we, a have, small area. we have four wineries, we have three breweries, we have two cideries and two distilleries. And we actually sell passports. If you purchase a passport, you get something free at each location. Which one should I try a little bit of? I'm going to say the wheat. All right, I'll try it. Okay. So wheat is known to bring texture to bourbon. Say, oh, so it's very okay. soft, right? There's a nice softness to yeah. it. But you know, then there's the rye. Rye kind of brings the spiciness. Corn brings the sweet note to bourbon. So the wheat is nice because you just have all that smooth texture. What is this? That's coconut rum. Yeah. We've got a peach whiskey. We have white rum, spiced rum, coconut rum, vodka, gin, wheat, rye, American, and then this is a cinnamon whiskey. Now, I like this. Are you a vodka drinker? Well, I am. But mm -hmm. Yes, I do like that. So having this big spring and the water really makes a big difference. It's mineral rich, it's really soft, but not too soft. It's hard enough, but not too hard. It just hits the it sweet hits spot. It's the right spot. It all comes down to the water. Okay. Absolutely. We're wrapping it up with this. I don't know why I want this. I'm not really a sweet kind of guy. But the coconut rum is interesting. You'll taste it, and it's not at syrupy. Oh, I just went to the Caribbean right there. It's still happening. Congratulations. Oh you can do that right here in Happy gosh. Valley. Thank you for this, by yeah, the way. you're welcome. That's really nice of you. You do have yeah. a cool gig. A theme I heard most from local business owners was, I went to school at Penn State and never left. You know, that says a lot about the region. The locals in Happy Valley love their valley, and they spend time hiking or biking here, because no matter where you are here, you're never far from a trail. Residents stay connected to their communities because they care about their neighbors. They attend annual events with the visitors, cheer on the Nittany Lions, they have fun, and so much more. But I had heard about a really cool mansion tucked away in plain sight filled with priceless artifacts from marquee history makers. Well, I just couldn't help myself. Well, Bob, the more time I spend here, it just keeps getting better and better and better and better. And this is an example of that, wouldn't you say? Yes, it is. And if we had a time machine to go back over 200 years, this is part of the King's Highway system. The colonies and then the subsequent nations first interstate highway system. So Little Bowlesburg is sitting a strategic location and as a result, so much of Happy Valley's history then springs from this. Why is it named Bowlesburg? So, and that comes in 1820 when the post office comes. Prior to that, the name of Bowlesburg is Springfield. And Bowlesburg, like our neighboring town of Belfont, are named for the beautiful springs that bubble up 365 days of year. But subsequently, the prominence of the bowls on the local, state, and international stages, they, the town is renamed for the bowls. While we're on the subject 200 years ago, what were people doing while they were here? So this is the frontier. So people would come into the premier city for most of America's history, no, not New York, Philadelphia. Right. And then from Philadelphia to the stopping off point for the frontier, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Got it. And then they would make their way to here. Well, what's here? There's no Penn State University at that point. Right. Forest industry, the early tanning of furs, and also metals, iron ore. I want to talk about this mansion. First of all, where are we? The Bull Mansion represents eight generations of the Bulls who lived here from the turn of the 1700s for then 200 years. They were descended from the kings and queens of Europe. They were through marriage related to Napoleon, Christopher Columbus. Well, I noticed there was some name dropping. The one that stuck, stuck out is Christopher Columbus. Yes. Now, if I have this correct, there are actual artifacts here. Why are they here? Despite the fact that Christopher Columbus never made it to North America, let alone <laughs> Bowlesburg, Listen, Pennsylvania. Listen, I know it's kind of the pink elephant in the room. Yeah. I didn't want to bring that up, but I don't think he sailed here. That's so, correct. Uh, Colonel Bull, as a young man, goes to Paris for his higher education, and there he meets this beautiful Parisian aristocrat. Now, Mathilde's aunt, Victoria Montalvo, who is the lady-in-waiting for Queen Isabella II, has met at court the descendant of Christopher Columbus, Diego Colon. 
And so towards the end of Aunt Victoria's life, she bequeaths to Colonel Bull all the contents of the Columbus family castle in the north of Spain. People come from all over the world. People will make a pilgrimage here to Bullsburg, Pennsylvania to see what is inside. This is run by volunteers. That's correct. Nearly 70 years, this has been a museum drawing people from all over the world. Can we go take a look, would you mind? Let's go take a look. And this was the culmination of the mansion, which has more rooms than Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home. So that is um, Napoleon's gaming box when he's a prisoner, when he's recaptured and placed on Elba where he perishes. And then there's a little locket of his hair. That's his actual hair? That's his actual hair. That's incredible. Um, that piano was purchased by Dolly Madison after the British burned the White House. These four artifacts are from King Tut's grandparents' tomb. These are actual weapons from 14, 1500, from chain mail to Spanish armor, and then from here to the Napoleonic colonial days. Let me show you something that no one has seen yet. These are all original maps, original posters, original photos, newspapers from World War I. Wealth begats more wealth. Yes. Um, so Napoleon III's wife was Princess Eugenie of the Spanish Empire, and she was very into fashion. And so she hires this budding interior decorator who makes boxes to make um, boxes for her fashions. And then her husband, Napoleon III, um, he decides, oh, I could use these for hauling my military things as I invade Italy, etc. So that's how Louis Vuitton gets his start. I think it deserves to be saved for future generations. I agree with you. I think once I open these protective doors, the door inside and everything hence, the windows, the doors, the balustrades, the altar, are all brought from Spain, dating back over 500 years. The castle was built in 1450 to commemorate a great victory over the Moors. So you're looking at Renaissance art. St. Jerome on the right, St. Francis of Assisi on the left. In that ornate frame is the letter from the bishop detailing how the two pieces of the left arm of the cross come out of Jerusalem and arrive in the hands of the Colognes. And here in this solid silver reliquary forming the cross here are two pieces of the left arm of the cross. So ours may be the most substantiated pieces of the true cross in the world. Do people come here and they're just speechless? Yes. There's a lot of that. Yes. You see this face a lot, don't yes. you? Yes. Yeah. And we love it. By the way, did you check out the pattern on that trunk from famed designer Louis Vuitton? Talk about a timeless design. Old Ben was right. My time here in the center of the state just slipped away, which is why we'll pick up where we left off in another episode from these five valleys. So check it out and then make your way here to feel it for yourself. Come for nature the food and drink, or the fascinating history. Because in my humble estimation, my visit was time well spent. So I was thinking in summation, you know what, on second thought, I'm gonna let this view speak for itself. That looks great. Uh, the turnip, not my hair. Come on, <laughs> Christina. I missed everything you said, it was overcome by the cheese. I don't know how my mom got your number. For heaven's sake, she won't leave us alone. Mom, all right. get back on the candy crush and stop. What time does wheel come on? <laughs> Il Delagard Bowl. That was my stage name in college. But all that's right. another show. We don't need to yeah. go into that. <laughs> I'm not getting off the boat. Sit. Somebody bring me some lunch and a pillow. How about five grand? We'll just take one of these things home with us. Seven. Seven will do. Gladys, get the pen ready. Is it true that your rock band that you were in was called Invasive Species in college? Is that, is that, <laughs> so it seems to me everything that I plant dies. Is it, is it my personality? I mean, I, I didn't realize you didn't taste the vodka. Yet. Well, I did in the I did in the men's room in the back. Does that count? I always bring a flask just in case. <laughs> you're still here. You're supposed to be lunching. Come on, it's your turn.